broadcast from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church of the evening message. Um, this is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church, and we're located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. Um, obviously, this is not the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church, but we're broadcasting uh, on the church's uh, Facebook page with our evening message tonight. We have just uh, two more weeks, to, or actually one more week after this to do this, two more uh, evening messages from here, and then uh, we'll be having an afternoon service live at the church at 1245 each Sunday, and uh, that will be live streamed on YouTube at the time. Uh, our usual uh, Sunday services begin at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning with the Sunday school class for all ages, and uh, that is live streamed on YouTube. At least the adult class is, not all the classes, but our, our adult class is, is uh, live streamed there. And you can check that lesson out from today um, on our YouTube channel, which is simply the Tacoma Bio Presbyterian Church YouTube channel. Also, you can see all the messages in uh, Sunday School Lessons in the series that we've been doing on the Ten Commandments and the family. Uh, today, we were working on the Fifth Commandment, and uh, we'll probably be having at least one more lesson on that. And then uh, at 10.30 a.m., we have our regular morning worship, and that also is live streamed on YouTube. And then, as I mentioned, Sunday nights this week and next week, we're here on Facebook and uh, then from then on, we'll be having our afternoon service rather than evening service beginning at 1245 live stream on YouTube. This is, a, of course, a special week. Um, on Friday evening at 7 p.m., we'll be meeting at the church and we'll be having a service in which we remember the uh, suffering and the death of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that service is made up mostly of scripture reading and hymn singing, and uh, we'd love to have you join us uh, for it. And uh, I think also we'll be showing that or streaming that on YouTube as well. And then Sunday morning uh, at 9.30, we'll have our usual um, Sunday school hour, and we'll have a special lesson relating to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then on uh, at 10.30, at our regular morning worship time, we'll be joining together with the Covenant Bible Presbyterian Church, and uh, we'll be having a special service in which we'll have special music um, by some folks from the Covenant Church and our own church. And we'll also have a series of short messages, meditations really, um, regarding the resurrection uh, by um, the assistant to the pastor, uh, Tyler Brillhart, and by our Minister of Education, uh, Steve Battiston, and then by um, Pastor Young of the Covenant Bible Presbyterian Church, and then myself. So we'll be bringing uh, four messages uh, of on perspective regarding the resurrection particularly, and then we have uh, some beautiful music planned too. So we invite you to join us for that service at the church but it too will be streamed on YouTube. Um, the next Sunday night, we'll be here at our usual time uh, from 6 to 7, and then that'll be the last of these Facebook uh, messages. Um, we also have small groups that usually meet during the week. Uh, some of them will be meeting, some not, I think, this week uh, because of the service on Friday evening. But if you contact us at the church, we'll be happy to let you know when and where those small groups meet. We also have a ladies' Bible study and a men's Bible study that uh, both meet at different times. And again, you can check that out at our website or call the church for information or email us or even Facebook message us and we'll get back to you with those details. Um, also, um, we have... Uh, um, a youth group that meets uh, as well, and we can give you details about that too. Um, we have uh, other activities, of course, that go on throughout the weeks that change with the different seasons and so on. And um, you can see our uh, whole um, 
uh, ministry and different aspects of it by checking out our website um, for the church. And you can link from our Facebook page to there. It's good to have the Marcelias with us tonight. Welcome to Peg and Andy. Uh, always glad to, to see you uh, signed on with us. Uh, we come on a little bit early to give people the opportunity to uh, chat for a moment before we get started. And so um, we uh, kind of get a running start into the, the message uh, each week. And uh, tonight <clears throat> we're going to be having our final message in this series on the life of Samuel. We didn't get very far um, because of the change in the way that we're doing our evening services, but uh, I hope it's been a blessing to at least uh, get started in that uh, life of Samuel and maybe give you some interest in following through, it, through on it yourselves. Greetings to uh, Pastor Steve from down in Florida. Good to uh, see him tonight, uh, signing in to say hello. Uh, pastor Steve is the pastor of the Grace Bible Presbyterian Church in uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida and uh, part of our denomination. Uh, looking forward to his being out here uh, pretty soon, uh, visiting as Western Reform Seminary, the seminary that we're associated with, um, is going to be having a series of lectures um, on the 14th and 15th of April, uh, dealing with uh, Christianity and Modernism. This is the 100th anniversary of Machen's book on that subject, and there'll be a series of lectures at our church, but they're actually um, sponsored by Western Reform Seminary. And uh, we're looking forward to Pastor Steve being here for that. Um, good to see Becky with us. Welcome to you, Becky. Um, it's good to uh, have your fellowship. And we did get word about Pauline, and we're praying uh, for her. Um, good to have Dick Flood with us tonight. Welcome to you, Dick. And uh, um, we'll be continuing here for a few minutes greeting folks um andersons who are usually with us are uh, not going to be with us tonight so we'll miss their fellowship uh, but we hope that the lord's blessing them um we uh um on the series of lectures uh, uh by western reform seminary um those lectures will be given by professors at the seminary but the lecture series will be held at our church. Um, there's also a fundraising dinner for the seminary on uh, the final night of the lectures. Um, also, we sponsor, and uh, uh, we're so thankful to do so, Heritage Christian School. Um, Heritage is a great blessing to us. We're so uh, glad for the opportunity to offer a good sound education to uh, young people here in the South Sound area. And uh, we are particularly grateful for our staff and the work that they do and the, the time that they put in uh, to educating the children from a Christian perspective. And uh, Heritage is filling up very quickly for next year. They're there may be a few spots left. I'm not sure even if there are at this point because things have been going so quickly. But uh, if you're interested in getting a good education for your son or daughter and uh, you want uh, that from a sound Christian perspective, then I would encourage you to contact Heritage and at least get on the waiting list for a class if not able to get into one. I think there are a few spaces left. but. Um, things have really filled up quickly and we're thankful for that um, but if you if that's something you need or you want for your child now is the time uh, to act on that we're so thankful to be able to uh, celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and we're looking forward to doing that we serve a living Savior and uh, next Lord's Day uh, we'll, we will be doing that and as I mentioned a moment ago, we'll be having a, a special service on Sunday morning, beginning at 10.30 a.m. at the church. Um, we'll have a series of sh short meditations uh, intermixed with uh, special music um, from both the Covenant Bible Presbyterian Church and uh, the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. Um, we're thankful to have their fellowship for this occasion, 
and uh, we're looking forward to being together, praising God together, uh, singing um, hymns together, uh, sharing God's word together. Um, so uh, if you're able, please join us for that service. We'd, we'd love to have you. If you're not able, please uh, go ahead and check us out on YouTube. Um, that service will be available there. Um, also, next Sunday, of course, we'll be having our Sunday school class at its regular time at 9.30. And uh, on occasions like this, we sometimes have a general class uh, for everybody, and that'll be the case next Sunday. Um, otherwise, we have classes for various ages, and uh, we're, we're so thankful to have the opportunity to take advantage of the gifts that God has given to our teachers and to, to give them that opportunity to, to share the truth with our children and with our teens and uh, then again with our adults. Um, we uh, are located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma. And uh, if you uh, need directions, um, we'd be happy to, to help you get here. But uh, these days, most people, all you need to do is just put it in your phone and it'll tell you how to get there if you, if you need to. Um, it's across from uh, um, Gray Middle School and uh, we're very thankful for the facilities God has given us there. Um, as I mentioned a bit ago, uh, after next Sunday, next Sunday we'll be meeting here at uh, six o'clock as usual. But after that, um, beginning on the following Sunday, we will be, um, I think I misspoke the dates about the lectures. I think the 13th and 14th, um, if I've got that right, is that yeah, right? Yeah, the 13th and 14th of April, not the 14th and 15th. Um, but the Sunday after, uh, that Sunday that week, the 16th of April, uh, we'll be beginning our afternoon service time. And uh, that'll be at 1245. Um, and uh, we'll be having a time of uh, hymn singing and then uh, a Bible lesson uh, in the afternoon. And that will be streamed on YouTube at that time. Now that's pretty much uh, the news as far as what lies ahead for us. We're just right now at our start time. Good to see the Robinsons joining with us now. Welcome uh, to you. Uh, Craig and Kim, glad to have, have you with us tonight. Um, I'm going to read from Psalm 138, verses 1 through 2. Um, it's a, a psalm by David, and this will get us started this evening. David says there, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple, and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And we do give God thanks. Let's join our hearts together now in prayer before him. Father, we do thank you for exalting your name and your word. We thank you, Lord, for opening our hearts to receive and understand that word. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel, the answer to the plague of sin that troubles the heart of man has separated us from you. Lord, we thank you for sending your only begotten Son that he might be the propitiation, the payment for our sins, that through his suffering and death we might have forgiveness and, Lord, be restored to you. We thank you for his blessed resurrection, which is the seal of the acceptance of his sacrifice and the joy of the people of God. Lord, we're gathered again tonight in many different places. We ask you, Lord, to bless us as we meet together around your word. May your hand of grace be upon us. Lord, we pray for those in need tonight. Um, we uh, think of Bill and Pauline, and we ask you, Lord, to be with them. We pray for those of our own congregation who are traveling, those who are 
struggling with illness, those, Lord, who are bereaved, we lift them all up before you and ask you, Father, to have your hand upon them all for good. Bless us now, Lord, as we look into your word. We pray that you would feed us out of it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to those who have joined us. Uh, um, the Zigers with uh, Bob, glad to have you with us. And John and Eva Battle, good to have you with us this evening too. I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 10 through 21 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 3 beginning with verse 10. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, your servant, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever. For the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more. Also, if you hide anything from me of all that he has told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless our reading from his holy and his inerrant word together tonight. We've just one more, as I mentioned earlier, of these Facebook studies after tonight. I went back in the archive and discovered that we started this on March 22nd, 2020. So at the end of last month, we have had, we've met together like this on Sunday evenings for three years and shared some 150 Bible messages. Next week, we'll be looking at a passage relating to the close of Resurrection Day. So tonight, as I mentioned earlier, will be our last lesson in the life of Samuel for now. The section we've just read really speaks for itself. Samuel, who is the last judge and the first of the prophets to attend the kings of Israel, is still a boy when he's called to receive the message regarding the end of Eli's family's service and abuse of the priesthood and the people of God. William Blakey says, in announcing to Samuel the coming catastrophe, God shows himself thoroughly alive to the magnitude of the punishment he is to inflict and the calamity that is to happen. It's a sober message for a boy to carry, and we can only imagine the strain it must have been that it must have put on, on Samuel to recite the Lord's word to Eli. But the old priest urges Samuel on, and Samuel tells all. And the Lord says that I'm about to do this thing in Israel that will make the two ears of everyone tingle. On that day, he's going to fulfill everything that he said about Eli 
and there's going to be no atonement or any sacrifice or offering that will change this forever. Now, Samuel takes his commission very seriously, and he honors the Lord by conveying the message that he was given and holding nothing back despite the circumstances. That is, despite his youth and his own position, despite Eli's age and honorable office, despite Eli's sons and their power and cruelty, and despite the condemning nature of the message itself, he holds nothing back. God's word is always to be viewed, beloved, not with the hearts, not with the hearers, excuse me, so much in mind, as with God and his power and his authority in view. With the truth and its ability to convict, to convince, and to convert in our thoughts as we deliver that word. Even uh, the words trustworthiness and its inevitability should be before us. Not so much the hearers, but those things regarding God and his word. There was but one right thing to do, and by the grace of God, Samuel did it, and it would stand him in good stead for all of his life, because this is not the last time, as a messenger of God, he, that is Samuel, is going to be called on to tell powerful people things that they do not want to hear. This was the calling of the prophets, from Moses to Malachi. Clearly, no good could come from hiding the full message. No good could come from trying to mitigate it or attempting to soften it. The sons of Eli and the high priest himself would only become more hardened in their disobedience if they did so. And nothing in the judgment would be changed or delayed just by mitigating it or softening the judgment. The judgment was still coming and it would be the same. The glory and honor of God would have been marred in the eyes of men and women by his putting the feelings of men and women before the word of God. And Samuel himself would prove to be an unfaithful servant of the Lord, bringing shame to himself and really to his faithful mother as well. And this remains true, beloved. Those who imagine that they make God more accessible or make him less objectionable by hiding elements of the truth, the truth of God's word, only serve to harden hearts and they do nothing to ease or delay the day of coming judgment for anyone. They only dishonor God and prove themselves to be unfaithful servants. The Lord himself said to Jeremiah the prophet, and this is in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 29 and 32. Jeremiah 23, in verse 29 it says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord? and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And then in verse 32, he says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness, when I did not send them or charge them, so they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. They don't profit the people because they don't tell them the truth. Blakey observes here, he did not shun to declare to Eli, this is Samuel, the whole counsel of God. Admirable example for all God's servants. How averse some, some men are to hear the truth. And how prone are we to try to soften what is disagreeable in our message to sinners. To take off the sharpness and sheathe it in generalities and possibilities. It is no real kindness. Mr. Brillhart touched on this during his sermon this morning. The error of avoiding the issue of sin, for one reason or another, serves no good purpose. 
And it certainly doesn't serve those that we are called to bring the gospel to. <clears throat> now, chapter 4 tells you how all of this that is recorded here of the 98-year-old Eli and his household unfolds. If you look in chapter 4, you see there that just in, in a short uh, uh, summary here, 34,000 Israelites die in two separate battles. The Ark of the Covenant is lost to the Philistines. Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's wicked sons, are killed. And when Eli, who has been trembling over the Ark being taken up to the battle, hears that his sons are dead and the Ark is captured, he falls backward, breaks his neck, and he dies. Now, that's a general sketch or outline of the events that Samuel was referring to. But I want to go back to Eli's somewhat famous words uttered when he first hears Samuel's report of this message from the Lord. It's 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 18. We read there, So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he that is Eli, said, It is the Lord, it is Jehovah. Let him do what or whatever seems or in his eyes appears to be good, good in every sense. Let him do whatever is good to him in every sense. I just want to reflect for a moment on these words of Eli. First of all, he says, it is Jehovah, the one who is wholly independent, the one who will glorify himself in all things, the one in whom there is no evil, and who will always bring true justice to prevail, the one who, coming, says, was as much obliged and concerned to carry on the world throughout history as he was to create it in the beginning. He adds this great truth, the truth that God is and God governs the world, explains all the phenomena which startle on the one hand and all the mysterious events, dispensations, and emergencies that perplex on the other. Now, this is one of those statements, it is Jehovah, that is so simple, but so powerful and sublime that we have to stop and think about it for a moment. Eli here surrenders because he knows that Jehovah, the free and independent God of the creation, cannot be successfully resisted or defeated in his holy purposes. He is, as Job says, the one who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. He's the one who says, behold, he snatches away. Who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? None can. This is not as if some human being sought to predict the future or made some pronouncement about what they were going to do through some threatened action. You know, it always amuses me when an action hero is tied up and uh, is it completely at the mercy of his enemies and maybe his girlfriend or his wife is there with him or, or a friend and he says, if you hurt her or if you hurt him, I'll hunt you down. And of course, in the movies and books, that usually can and does happen. While in real life, that threat would be hopeless and meaningless because the person is completely at the mercy of those that he's threatening. It only works because it's a piece of fiction and nothing more than a manifestation of how man, men and women dream of their own deity. But it's not really possible under the circumstances and wouldn't be under the circumstances makes a great movie, but it doesn't have any real 
connection with reality. Ah, but when Jehovah declares that he intends to secure vengeance against his enemies, it's not fiction. It's inevitable. There's nothing that can restrain him. There's nothing that can stop him. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. There are three ways to respond here to what is being said to Eli. Eli could repent in sackcloth and ashes and obey God and restrain his sons and remove them from office and even deal with them more thoroughly. He can resist God's word and rebel further against God and strive in, in vanity, in, vainly, to preserve himself and his family. Or he can do as we see him doing here, recognize his sinfulness and the sinfulness of his sons and do nothing, just accept the outcome. And it is this third course that he chooses. His will was too feeble to control his life. He was too apprehensive of immediate trouble, of present inconvenience and unpleasantness to carry out firm principles of action against wickedness, even in his own family, says William Blakey. Some see Eli repenting here, but it's not the sort of repentance that leads to life. It's the sort that brings sin to light. Every trespass, every omission, as Cummings says, whether it is the connivance where there ought to have been rebuke, the convenient compromise where there ought to have been faithful denunciation of sin. And he saw now, because of that, retribution coming up at the heels of sin and the cup of sorrow being his portion, and judgment about to begin at the house of God, but he's unable to act or to show any energy one way or the other. He is what we might term a spiritual sluggard. Proverbs 19.24 says, The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. He won't even bother to lift the food to his mouth. Eli recognizes the sin. He recognizes God's justice in dealing with that sin, but he won't do anything about it. He says instead, let him do whatever pleases and seems good to him. And here Eli acknowledges both the free agency and the power of God, as we mentioned earlier. Jehovah possesses both the freedom and the power to do whatever he pleases including to act as the judge of all. No man, woman, or child holds either that freedom or this power in his or her hands. Though in the quest to be gods, they often try and even imagine at times that they do possess that attribute. But Eli at least knows that this isn't so, or so it seems. I do wonder why he was not more moved if he was truly under this conviction as he expresses it here. It's just amazing that he isn't moved by it. To me, as, as I read this sometimes, I think it could almost be read as a taunt to the Lord. Most commentators, however, understand it as just another example of his rather passive attitude towards everything. So we can consider it then a, a sort of it will be whatever it will be, surrender before the Lord. It's worth noting, I think, that Eli himself knows what is good. He, we see that in even his actions. He, he tells his son that what, sons that what they're doing is not good. So he knows what is good, but he can't bring himself to execute it. But he knows that God will, and that it cannot be altered, because God can and God will do whatever he judges to be right. In Psalm 135, verses 5 through 6, we read, For I know the Lord is great, 
and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. But it's not just what he pleases, but what seems, even Eli says, or is judged to be good in his pure eyes. John Gill says this, Not what seems good to men, or is so in their esteem, but what seems good to the Lord, who knows what is best for his people, and can do nothing but what is good. All is good that he does. There is nothing but goodness in him, and nothing but goodness comes from him. He does good and nothing else. So I want to close tonight with just some concluding observations about this goodness of the Lord. First of all, beloved, we may thank God that this is so, that he is free to do what seems good to him. John Gill says, all he does is well done in creation, providence, and grace. Even now, beloved, with all that's transpiring in our world, and despite all the wickedness and the injustice of men and women, God is doing whatever seems or appears in his just sight, his pure sight, to be good, working all things together for our good and for his glory. We think that we know what is just and right and will serve us and the world and God's glory best. But the truth is that we are very ignorant people. I think for myself, I can't speak for others, but I think I surely would have agreed with Peter when he rebuked Jesus for talking about his suffering and his death. You recall the scene, it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 16, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. And in verse 21, we're told that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And we're told then in verse 22 that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he, that is Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you are not settling your mind or setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Beloved, there are great matters unfolding right now in the larger scheme of things, in the purpose of God for the ages, issues that you and I cannot imagine. But we will be eternally grateful that he's doing them even right now, even tonight. We will be eternally grateful that he is doing what seems good to him, that he is engaged to fulfill his word, that he is engaged right now to secure your eternal peace and to secure the establishment of the kingdom of his son. Yes, right now, in all the turmoil, and all the seething darkness of the day, your God is doing good. He's doing it. And we will see the fullness of that good in the right time. The thing to remember is that when he is doing good, it always causes conflict. God doing good sometimes means bad things for men and for women, as it did for Eli. This is what a superstitious and shallow faith can't grasp. Being good as God is good, demands justice. It demands the triumph of truth. It demands the exposure and punishment of evil. When God is dealing with Eli this way, and with his people too, he is doing good. 
Those who have the idea that God is good and is therefore like a, a doting old grandparent figure who doles out favor and holds no one responsible for anything or accountable for anything have an improper, superstitious, and sentimental view of the goodness of God and not a biblical one. An accurate picture of the goodness of God is seen in the book of Exodus, first in chapter 33. In chapter 33, this exchange takes place. This is in Exodus 33, beginning in verse 18. Moses is speaking to the Lord. He's praying, and he says to the Lord, Please show me your glory. And the Lord answers and says to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So Moses asks for a display of his glory. The Lord answers, okay, I will show you all my goodness. And then you come to chapter 34, where the Lord keeps his promise and reveals himself to Moses, letting all his goodness pass before him. And what do we read there? Well, beginning in Exodus 34, verse 6, we read this. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness. So far, that sounds like the goodness of the Lord. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. That's part of the fullness of his goodness. Who will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses, in the face of the whole picture of God's goodness, we're told, quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. All his goodness includes both mercy and justice. And that's why he gave his son to be the propitiation for sins. Because there could only come, because mercy could only come where justice had been satisfied. And that's so because he is good. He couldn't forgive without holy justice being satisfied. And he sent his son to do that so that we might have the forgiveness of sins. Matthew Henry says he is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works, and therefore his will be done. The 118th Psalm, which is recited by believers all over the world on Palm Sunday today, that great psalm begins with these words. This is the first verse of Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And that same psalm ends with these words, beginning in verse 27. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Beloved, redemption is a result of the goodness of the Lord. Judgment is a result of the goodness of the Lord. Eli and his house will fall because the Lord God Jehovah is good. Jesus Christ was sent to redeem men and women from their sins because God is good. Paul wrote to Titus in Titus 3 and verse 4 saying, When the goodness, when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
We thank you that you are good. And Lord, we thank you that that goodness has provided for not only the satisfaction of holy justice, but for our redemption and salvation. Lord, we pray that no one who sits under the hearing of the word will be tempted to take the passive attitude that Eli does here and say under the pending ground of their own judgment for sin, it is Jehovah, let him do what seems good to him. But rather, uh, Lord, they would have the grace to be able to cry out and say, Lord, give me that forgiveness which is promised through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, move them where they cannot move themselves. And Lord, give them energy. Lord, for all of us who have been moved by you and have not been willing to uh, just sit passively by in our sins and receive our judgment, we thank you for the goodness that sent the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Redeemer, to be our Savior, to be the propitiation for our sins. Oh, Lord, how we thank you. And we thank you, Lord, for fixing our hearts on him and helping us to see that it's in him that we have the hope of redemption. Lord, we rejoice in your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. And we pray that you would receive our thanks tonight. Now, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.